May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Kuk Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Kuk Audio and Kuk Archives, preserving the legacy of Shinju Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his, and those whose paths cross his, even today and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today we have a guest, Dennis Marshall, who um, just is turning 90 about right now. And um, he was uh, a student at uh, the Zen Center during the Shunyu Suzuki days and later during the Richard Baker days and uh, is, uh, has been uh, associated with Richard Baker's uh, Dharma Sangha in Germany and in Colorado, where he's living now near Crestone in a home. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a long uh, story. We... Yeah, uh, Dennis, Dennis comes in and starts talking about coming to Zen Center, I don't know, around an hour and 15 minutes into it. Uh, but uh, it's sort of a shaggy dog story, I think. Uh, but uh, we take him from uh, uh, <laughs> from way back then in England, in Yorkshire, uh, to... Um, Crestone today, and uh, I think it's a, an interesting journey. So as soon as we've had our uh, pause to meditate, we'll give him a call. So when you hear the bell, if you're of such a mind, hit pause and meditate or whatever for as long as you want. And when you're ready to come back, hit unpause, and we'll be here to hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever and give Dennis Marshall, a call and um, see what he has to say. Hi, Dennis. Hey. How are you? I'm okay. I'm pretty good. How are you? Okay. Okay. Great to talk with you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, is, have you had breakfast yet? No, I don't eat early. You don't? Anyway, I, I'm, I'm just telling you I'm aware that it's your morning. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Let's see. Uh it's uh, nine here, nine oh four. Yeah, and I've been up since about six, uh -huh. and all I've had is uh, uh, hot water and tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, oh. Yes. Well, um, you had you had, maybe had some idea of what you wanted to talk about, I guess. Oh, don't worry about that. Okay. We'll just talk. Yeah. Um, what What are you doing now? What are you up to today? Today was actually the first day for a while when I felt I'm going to get some things done. <laughs> and so actually yeah. I washed a window, which has been bugging me for the longest time. And uh, a guy came who I, I've known in the past uh, to fix my... Um, my uh, oven, which the the bit of it work, that works like a pilot and lights the oven, uh, he, yeah. he came and replaced that. It had gone dead, 
which is a big relief because I, I hadn't realized quite how much um, I, I, uh, I kind of depend on the oven until it went out and I couldn't use it. <laughs> uh -huh, I suddenly realized, uh -huh. oh, I can't make pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, you're living in uh, Crestone, right. uh, pretty near, I've been to your place. Yes. Uh, pretty near uh, Crestone Mountain Zen Center. Uh, it's a 10 minutes drive, about, about, about 10 minutes. It's only a mile as the crow flies, but it's a, it takes about 10 minutes to get there. Oh, really? Oh. Oh, I forgot you're that far away. Hmm. Well, it, it, it's not, it is only actually literally a, a mile, but yeah. with the way the roads are around here, you, you can't just... Yeah. It, have you got snow? We've had very little. We've had some, but very, very little. There was, a, uh -huh. there was maybe a few inches last week. And since then, it's gone back to sunshine again. So wow, that's that's at about nine thousand feet, isn't it? Eight thousand. Eight thousand. Approximately uh, eight thousand. And um, wow, people are going to start worrying before very long because of the lack of moisture. Right. You know. Right. I know when when I lived in Santa Fe for a year. Now, I, I had visited a lot, uh -huh. but when I lived in Santa Fe for a year back with uh, Elan uh -huh. and uh, Baby Clay back in uh, 92, 93, uh -huh. uh, I, it took me months to adjust to the altitude. The altitude, yeah. Well, I take oxygen at night. Uh -huh. I... Um I have a machine provided by by uh, um, Social Security, and uh, that's so oh I, nice of them. Yeah, so I uh, <laughs> I get I put myself on about eight hours or t maybe twelve hours sometimes of of, of oxygen. Uh, um, I I used a, I found a humidifier helped a lot. Uh, I I don't b w worry too much about that. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I know it's dry, but I, I, I'm not particularly aware of that. But, uh, oxy yeah. With oxygen, they just made me kind of have it because uh, one day I was in Alamosa and I, a doctor just, he, he was looking at me for something, I was a boil or something on my hand. And uh, they, they suddenly freaked out when they took all my vital statistics and whipped me into the emergency room and put me on oxygen and uh, huh. told me I had to go and see my my doctor and, and arrange to get it regularly, which is, you know, it's good. Baker Roche uses huh. he's used it for years. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, um, that's, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Um, hmm. So, um, um, how do you spend your days there? Well, uh, um, I'm, I'm slowly trying to work up to being a bit more active because I'm almost impossible to plan things because I just don't have that kind of energy at the moment. And, yeah. And, and um, since I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is, um, is get my life to be a, a bit um, more you know, planable. And uh, I, have I told you? Yeah, I did. I told you in an email. We're talking about me being able to move into into Zen Center and build a build a house or build a camp. Yeah, and, yeah, that's neat. Well, if that's I can do that, that will kind of just bring my mind a little bit more to life, I think. And um, and what would you do with your current place? Um, well, I'd have to sell it. I have a reverse mortgage, which gives, uh -huh. gives me a little bit of money and um, I, every month. And um, I, uh, I'm told the the um, one of the realtors around here 
told me that uh, the market is, as it is, as it is everywhere, actually, pretty good right now, or very good. Mm-hmm. And um, and she said it will just sell very quickly if we put it on the market. And mm. I think I might come out of it with about after. Then I have to pay off what I owe on the reverse mortgage because they send me all this this money every month. And um, yeah. Uh, so I'll have to repay that. I, I just got the invoice a couple of days ago, and I see that I now owe them 150 or something thousand. And mm. uh, yeah, gulp. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I, they were, when the realtor came, she told me. By the way, she's the um, widow of the ma- one of the people who was very involved. In building the dome up at Zen Center. Oh, uh, ah. Keith Chadwick was an English architect who did it. Uh, with Keith the, Chadwick, what an excellent name! <laughs> yeah, now you come across it now and then. <laughs> ah, uh huh. Yeah. Anyway, she was. The, he was very supportive of that whole thing. Her, her husband of those days. Yeah, well, that the dome was built when it was uh, Lindisfarne yes, Association right. before uh, uh, Dharma Sangha got it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, she yeah. told me that um, she, um, I, she could almost. She didn't actually use the word guarantee, but she could pretty much guarantee two hundred and forty thousand, maybe two hundred and fifty, and she looked across to her assistant and said 270. So it sounds as though I can clear my debt of 150 and um, and have, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 or something to build a cabin. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Well, that's, that's great. That's great. Um, and, and how long have you been in Creststone. In Creststone, 30, 30 years. I came in 91, so it's just over 30 Is that years. right? Yeah. Is that right? When, you must have been in, in uh, Santa Fe then when I first came. No, 91 I was in Japan. Japan. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, we moved to Santa Fe for a year when we left Japan. It was a plan uh, because I wanted to work on that, my first book, Thank You and Okay, uh-huh. An American Zen Failure in Japan. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, I didn't want to go to the Bay Area then. And Elon also wanted, you know, to be somewhere else and to study. Uh-huh. And uh, so she went to school. And, yeah, we, we had a wonderful time in Santa Fe that year. Uh-huh. But, uh, and Was that Welsh there in those I, days? Well, I think he was in. I think he was with Deborah in Santa Fe. Yeah, no, oh yes, yeah. Dan was. No, he yeah. wasn't with Deborah. He was with KC in uh, uh, Santa Fe. Oh, KC. Yeah, and he was very helpful. As a matter of fact, he helped us decide to yeah. move there. He was very enthusiastic about us I'm moving sure. there, yeah. uh, and took me around and introduced me to people and. Yeah, that was great. That was a great year, great year. And it was also a very snowy year. There was, uh, I I looked it up, it was the second snowiest year of the whole century. That's right. And we had snow in our yard for five months. Yes, yes. Yeah, I remember uh-huh. it, was, it was, it was my first winter, and I remember that. Mm. In, in um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, um. Uh, I'd like to move back to where you were born. Oh, go right through it so, um, with dates and things. So well, I'll try. I was born in 1931. 31. So wait a minute. Let's let's add that up. So 69, 31 would be 69 plus 21 Ooh, would be 69. 90. What? What's that? You're ninety. Yeah, I was ninety last week, or well, week, a couple of weeks ago. Hey, congratulations! And I'm, <laughs> thank you. I'm now trying yeah. to say I'm in my ninety-first year being Japanese. 
<laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. That's exactly how they do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It's uh, yeah. Um, hmm. And racehorses. That's. I think I heard that anyway. That and what? I've I heard racehorses age is. And this can't be true, but I remember it from long ago, like fifty years ago. Yeah. That racehorses age uh, on January first. Like like Japanese do, but anyway, forget that. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. Yep. Um, I find an enormous amount of stuff that I believe and think turns out not to be true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you were born in 1931. Where? In uh, in Yorkshire, in actually a town called Bingley. Um, or a, a suburb of Bingley, which is near Bradford. And mm. uh, interestingly enough, I guess we, I remember talking about this in Germany to, on one lunchtime. Uh, Cottingley Bridge, which is the little suburb, uh, was, became famous about 50 years before I was born when um, some schoolgirls duped the entire world with having taken photographs of fairies. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> and they, were, they lived in Cotting the Bridge, which is just a few houses. And, um, <laughs> and um, among the people who got interested was um, uh, the guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes, who was that Conan, Conan Doyle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he believed it. <laughs> he believed it. Oh, and he oh that's it. so great. <laughs> and when you think... Of, of, of Sherlock Holmes is a character that yes. can see through <laughs> right. every foil. Right. Oh, right. anyway, oh, great. that was cutting the bridge. That's where I was. I was born. And, is uh, that right? Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> I yeah, I remember reading about that. That good for them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It, it lasted a long time. Apparently, they got away with it for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my gosh, that's something. You know, something I remember at Green Gulch back in Boa uh -huh. when uh, maybe 73. Were you at Green Gulch in 73? I think in 73 I was at Tassajara. I might well, have moved to Green Gulch at the end of 73. It might have been 74, uh, something like that. Yeah, uh, I, I don't actually. What I remember is talking to you and getting you to speak to me the way people spoke yes. where yes. you grew up. Can you do that for us? Yeah, I, I, I did. I, I, I remember you commenting on this in the past. Uh, weren't you Shuso in 93? No, I was Shuso in, in 75. I mean, 70, not 93, 70, 75. Oh, 75. Uh, spring. Well, no, was, wait a minute. 74. 74. 74. Well, I was at yeah, not 70. then. 74 spring. And you were at Tassara. Yes. Oh, so you were at Tassara when I was head monk. Oh, yes. far out. Yes. So maybe that's where it was. Yes. I think I did it at Green Gulch, too, because I used to do it periodically to you. I'd love to hear it. So <laughs> can can you uh, s speak to us a little do it now. the way well, people I remember spoke? remember the way that, that, that you picked up on it was... I told you how they count in in Westmoreland, which is not Yorkshire. Uh, it's where I went to cram to boarding school, and the, yeah. they have a very special way of counting: yant, tant, tithery, mithery, eaters, flaters, others, dovers, dick. <laughs> that's one to ten. Wow! <laughs> wow! And that's Cumbrian, huh? actually, uh, Westmoreland. Westmoreland. In Yorkshire, I, they talk pretty much the way I'm talking now. Um, but, oh, there is a little rhyme I may have told you. Um, we're, down, um, we're down in coil oil. We're muck clarts on twinders. That's where we are. We're no one can find us. We're down in the coal hole. hole. Um, where the dirt sticks to the windows 
um, we're down in the coal hole where no one can find us. <laughs> <laughs> That's Yorkshire dialect. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I guess you would show me, uh, uh, you would speak like some places where maybe where you went to school. Yeah, well, uh, I went. I, I went to. Well, we, we, um, when we were cutting the bridge, Bingley, the first place, I was only there for about three years, I think, maybe two years. And, but it was right on the edge of the moors. In mm -hmm. fact, it was only seven miles from from the um, parsonage where the Bronte sisters lived with their father, mm -hmm. wrote all their book, poems and books and things, right on the edge of the moors. And then we moved to about 10 miles away, somewhere called Bailden. And that again was on the moors. And then we went to a place called Tranmere Park Geisley. And again, that was just literally a quarter of a mile where our house was, right on the edge of the Yorkshire Moors, which are all part of Ilkley Moor, in a sense. Ilkley Moor. Well, well, but tell us what a moor is. A moor is, is a wild, wildish, um, grassy, uh, tends to grow heather and bracken and, and, and things like that. But it's kind of walk, good walking country. Um, hills, hilly usually, uh, up country, mm -hmm. um, but open wild land, not quite a mountain. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. Yorkshire Moors are rather famous, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, if you've mm -hmm. read any of the Brontes, you know, they had, you know, they really centred their books in that kind of moorland, moorland country. Mm. 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 Um, well, so how did your life progress? <laughs> Badly. <laughs> I, I remember. I seem to remember telling you a couple of weeks ago that um, I'd been thinking about autism. You remember? Did, uh -huh. I, did I mention that? You did. You did. Yeah. Well, what clued me into the idea? By the way, I wrote to Roshi a couple of days ago and got a, a letter, a message back yesterday from him saying, don't worry about the diagnosis, <laughs> just live your life, which, of course, he would say. And I, I doubt he yeah. even wants me to talk about it particularly. Yeah. But I feel quite comfortable with the idea that that's probably what was behind all the troubles and difficulties. And I had a very difficult life. We all, I suppose we all do, but I had a particularly difficult life in some ways. And I, what I caught on to was that um, autistic people? Not we're not talking like childhood autism. We, you know, you. Know, I mean, I think of children who have autism. You can recognize them. You know, they look as if they have autism. And um, but th there's there's recently been publicity given to uh, an autism which is only recognized in middle age. People mm. have been writing about it a lot, just this last few years. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and the stories that they tell and that I read clued me in to that's what my difficulties were and are. Well, we, I, I, tell me what your difficulties were. Well, in my it was real difficulty in... in, in by the way, is any of this... When you said podcast, was that something to do with with um, with? Um, um, <laughs> I want to hear what your troubles were. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, I, first I, I will then talk about the kind of things that I was reading about by people who had, you know, um, become autistic and, and uh, or, or been diagnosed at the age of 40 or 50. And they, they all said, they all say, there are books about this, they all say, you can't get, you have difficulty communicating with people, forming or keeping relationships, um, um, holding a career, and, um, and just generally developing 
in the ways that other people do. You, you can be brilliant, and in fact, they're called high-performance auti- autistic people. You can be really brilliant, but you still have these strong difficulties which get in the way, and that's that was my pattern. Uh, that, that well, well, I'd no communicate. My mother died when I was nine. My father had been in the First World War. He was in the machine gun corps, and um, he was an almost monosyllabic person. He couldn't talk at all. He just closed his closed himself off. Uh, I mean, he was a successful businessman. and um, But but there was no relationship feeling between him and me at all. Uh, he took care of me. He, he fulfilled his duty. He sent me to a good school and, and, and fed me and all those things. But there was no feeling or very, very, very little feeling between us and uh, so that sort of probably drove was partly why I didn't develop emotionally myself in terms of understanding people and and and, and how how people relate to each other and all those kind of fun things and um so um Learning about autism kind of just added to that. That that oh well, there was also that going on, and uh, uh, and so then after at school, I didn't I didn't make any friends, for example. Well, I made one sort of friend, but by and large, I didn't make friends. Even when I got left there and got married later. Um, I remember when my, my, the woman who became my wife, Margaret, when, when we would be out walking with this church group, we were in, in a church group, Methodists, and um, I would just be trailing along at the back, not talking to anybody, even when, you know, and she had all these friends. And uh, so that, that was just my pattern, was no friends. How did how, how how did you get along with her? Well, I mean, we we both just very much wanted to get married for the, all the reasons young people have, you know, <laughs> you want to get away away from home, change everything, and blah blah blah. So there was a lot of pressure just to get married. I mean, and and therefore, uh, like you know, at the age of twenty one or whatever it was, um, we. Um, we um, uh, well, you know, we, we courted each other, just the, way, the regular way people do. But that was just with one person. And yeah, but how did you get along with it? Well, now, looking at it now, the way I see it is, we just didn't get along at all. But actually, we, you know, we were very friendly. Of course we were. We wanted to get married and stuff like that. But there was no... Looked at with hindsight, there was no real relationship there. And... um, You you coexisted. You coexisted. It's what? You you coexisted. Yeah. You lived together. All right. Now, was there was there unpleasant drama? Did you argue? No, almost zero unpleasant drama. Well, that's good. That's a good relationship, (laughs) I think. (laughs) Well, yeah, but it's it's it it wasn't it wasn't one where I I I I I felt anything. I don't know. It's hard to talk about it, but I I, 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 I don't. Um, it, it it was just a, a, a non-relationship, it, as I now understand relationship. And, um, uh, but uh, you did did you support each other uh, in a way like uh, uh, 
How did she spend her days? Did she work? Did you work? Yeah, we both were working. I was a, a young newspaper reporter. Oh, wow, you were. Huh. <laughs> and and where? In the same place, Yorkshire? All over the place. Um, I started, we've missed out the time I went to board. Um, uh, b before I get into that, I went to boarding school. Yeah. And uh, in, in the Lake District of England, beautiful part of England. And um, uh, that was during the war. And so it didn't encourage me to be, um, because of, you know, the, the kind of the way we ate in those days. I still have the habits of thrift and not spending anything and, and things like that, coming out of all this kind of background that was going yeah. on in those days. It was the 1940s. So anyway, after school, I just wanted to be um, a journalist. I I'd, I'd got excited about a foreign correspondent on the paper that I read at home during the school holidays. I wanted to be like this guy. He was a real hero of mine. He, lived, he was in China. And um, so... <laughs> I'm doing all this talking, I can hardly, hardly believe it. But um, <laughs> um, I've, I've told this thought this to before. But but um, uh, my father um, came to the school on the very the, the day before I left school after eight years at its boarding school. He yeah. never visited before. <laughs> <laughs> So that just gives you a, a little bit of a picture. <laughs> and so oh, I, I'm, I hope all this doesn't go in the, into print. But anyway, I, I, um, I uh, for example, I was, the, I was pretty clever at school. And um, I was always top of the class. And on the final speech day, when my father came for this final day, I had won six or seven prizes, <laughs> including the kind of outstanding contributor to the community life of the school. Um, I, I played music in the cello in the orchestra and stuff like that, and reading the Bible and, uh, to the school in, in the morning service and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, um, so I, I, I'd got all these prizes, and afterwards I was leaving the hall carrying my cello um, and gave my father the books to carry, this big pile of <laughs> prize books. <laughs> and he just took yeah. one look at them and he said, couldn't you have chosen some good books? <laughs> 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 that's, so that's... <laughs> I mean, and that's all he said. So that that's a kind of little vignette of the kind of relationship we had. Mm, yes. And so yeah. I'm, I'm, what I'm getting to is that he then went to for his first discussion with the headmaster, and he came out afterwards, and I was opening the door for him, and he said the headmaster said something about your you could go to university. Do you want to? And I, I had never thought about it. Nobody ever mentioned the word to me. We had people in my, in the sixth form, different years of the sixth form with me, who were going up to Oxford and Cambridge and Sheffield and Newcastle universities all over the place. But nobody ever discussed with me going to university mm -hmm. or mentioned the idea. And I'd never thought about it. So I just wanted to be a journalist, <laughs> a reporter. <laughs> and so so um, uh, he, he, my father just said, do you want to? Maybe the headmaster mentioned it, do you want to? And uh, I just said, I don't know, I, no, I guess not. And that was the end of it. And so... Then I had to go into the army. We did national service in those days, 
two years. What ago. year? What year? Well, that was 1950, 50, I think. Might have been 51. No, I think it was 1950, end of 1950. Oh, so and you were we, I was 18, 19, or 19, 18. 19, 18 or 19, yeah. And um, so I went into the Royal Artillery and spent nearly two years in Malta uh, uh, in the artillery. And uh, mm -hmm. when I came out, I had no idea what I was going to do at that point. I'd forgotten about the journalism. And um, first of all, I got the job in Woolworths, stacking shelves. <laughs> and then I uh, realized that wasn't for me. I got pneumonia. I'd had pneumonia every single year of my teens, six times, seven times. Really? And, uh, yeah. And, um, uh, and so I, after pneumonia, when I was at Woolworths, I got a job in a library, public library, Leeds City public libraries and um, had some difficulties there. I had never realized that people try to keep jobs by being nice to people. <laughs> but I'd not learned anything about social relationships and I had no idea about being nice to people and they just picked up on my bad temper at the mm. library and um, sent me to what was called the circulating department, which was where, instead of being in a, a, a big branch library or the central library, um, uh, instead of that, they uh, put me in this place where you took out a box full of books to a tiny little schoolroom somewhere out in the suburbs, a different one every night, and um, to, just so that I didn't have to communicate with people as much. Uh huh. And, uh, uh huh. I see. And, and and so that that it wasn't working out. And then I got into a fight with the man who was the manager of the circulating department. Uh, apparently, I you mean I, an I, argument? I, do you mean an what? argument? A what? Do you mean? Do you mean it, an argument? An argument, at least an argument. I may have punched him. I'm not sure. Oh. But. I'm not sure about that, but but certainly a, 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 a kind of violent argument. And so they took me out of the library altogether and put me in the <coughs> treasurer's office writing the paychecks for the rest of the people in the library. It's a big library, Leeds, you know, hundreds of librarians. And, uh, mm. and, and they wouldn't let me meet the public anymore. <laughs> and so... <laughs> After a, a few months of that, I was at the library for a year or two, a few months of that, and at this time I was courting Margaret, my wife-to-be, who was also a librarian at Leeds Libraries. Mm. And, um, and they, um, uh, I, got, I got fed up with this business of just writing checks for people and stuff. And... Um, and remembered I wanted to be a journalist. <laughs> so uh -huh. I got the trade magazine and was looking at all these jobs. And uh, I was several of them. But the, first, the only one that came through to begin with was in advertising, not in journalism. And I got this job as a copywriter for... for uh, and so I left home to take this job and go in a different city and um, I'd been living with my father and, and so forth and um, got this this job and then week I took the job I got an offer to be a, a journalist from one of the other applications oh and so that's good I, I'd become a copywriter writing hot point what Washing machine copy and stuff like that. And <laughs> the advertising manager was very. He said, "You you're making a mistake." When I told him after a week, I'm leaving. <laughs> he said, "You're making a mistake." But anyway, I went off to Kidderminster on the Kidderminster shuttle, a weekly paper, 
and did that for a year or, or so as a, the local weekly paper reporter, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A, a reporter. And then I rapidly got a job on a, a daily paper back in the north of England in Yorkshire and um, uh, on the Yorkshire Evening Post, Yorkshire Evening News, and uh, which was within a, an hour's bus drive of where Margaret was working in a library at that mm-hmm. time. And, and so it got me back close to her. And uh, so I was a reporter there for a year. And then they made me a cop, a, what we call here, a sub-editor, which in America is called a copy editor. Copy editor. And um, uh, so I did that for a year as a copy editor. Meantime, we had our first baby, first child. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, and then, but I was always on the move wanting to get more money and move up, but never thinking. I, I had no understanding of of, of, of of becoming a responsible person who was valued, you know, in, in, as a member of the staff in that way. I had no sense of that. Uh-huh. And so, and, and after a, a, a year as a sub-editor with the Evening News, I got a job on a national newspaper in Manchester, the Daily mm. Mail, which is, you know, about the biggest paper in England that still to this day. And um, but this was the Manchester Northern Edition, so I got a job there as a, as a sub editor. We moved to Manchester, and oh, near Manchester, and uh, which was my father had meantime moved to the Manchester area, so. Uh, we we visited him with the grandchild and things, and um, and uh, so now I had a year there, but it was working nights nice, because this was a daily morning paper, big paper, the Daily Mail, and uh, I decided in order to get a day job, I would find a magazine job. And I wrote to London, got a job on John Bull magazine, which was like Saturday Evening Post in England. It was the equivalent. Yeah. It was the same equivalent of that. And I got a job and I worked there for two years as a, as a, a sub-editor. And um, was also at the weekend moonlighting on Saturdays on the Sunday papers. Um as a copy editor, for all kinds of papers. The Sunday Dispatch, the Sunday Times, anybody who, you know, needed somebody, I would do that on Saturdays. And so these were all big national newspapers. And, but I was, again, not creating a career. I was just trying to get more money all the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, is it, I'm really going on at length here, David. Is that Okay. At that yeah. point, at that point, I oh, I also went into politics. Friends, we were living <laughs> in Beckenham. We bought we bought, bought a uh, bought a house, my first, the first house we had, and we had a second child, Timothy, who is by the way a rather famous person now, one of the best known writers in England at the moment. Is um, that right? Yeah, but that's a separate story. Tim, Tim Marshall. You can look him up online. He's all over the place. But anyway, he's had New York Times bestsellers and all kinds of stuff. Oh, and, wow. Um, he became a journalist, and he was diplomatic editor for Sky News, television, mm. stuff like that. But anyway, that's by the way. Tim was born while I was in London, on the magazine, John Bull, which changed its name to Today Magazine. And friends at the Methodist Church, Margaret was brought up as a Methodist. And I, by this time, I was... <laughs> I had become a local... what we call a local preachers. I was preaching. 
as a Methodist, a local preacher. Really? And, as a <laughs> but but you were a lay a, a lay person. A lay you weren't a you weren't a minister. No, no, but I you meant you went out and you read the hymn out the hymn numbers and read the lesson from the Bible. Where? At the church? At, at, well, at the, not at the main church, but at the little village churches. They, they sent out... Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. People called local preachers. And um, so I was doing that, and friends at the church said, who were very hot socialist Labour Party people, and I had by this time stopped supporting my father's politics, which was conservative stories, and and kind of was had gone into, you know, the the kind of more progressive left wing area, a bit of rebellion feeling kind of stuff, and um, and they said we think you should run for the council as a Labour Party. <laughs> these friends at the church and they fixed it, re arranged it all for me and so I did <laughs> and I got 30 votes it was the richest area in the town Beckenham, Kent and, uh, <laughs> very wealthy, wealthy place where everybody voted Tory but they just wanted to put somebody up they wanted to uh -huh. have a candidate and oh. so they made me the candidate and I got about 30 votes from this little corner where they had some public housing, <laughs> social uh <-huh>. housing. <laughs> anyway, that was just the poly. But having got into it, why I'm telling you that is that having got into politics, I was also in getting interested in the Labour Party generally, and the, the, the whole anti-colonial thing that was happening in England at that time shedding all the colonies, you know, getting rid of them. Right. And, and I wanted to be part of that. And so I, I I saw this job after a couple of years on the magazine. I saw this job um, in Kenya where the Mau Mau rebellion was happening. And I thought I could be part of this um, rebellion against the empire stuff. You know? Yeah. And so I applied to the colonial office to become an information officer there. That's what the job they offered. And I went to see these big high, bigger wigs at the colonial office. They gave me an interview. And um, they said, well, Marshall, um, we think you're a little young to be a senior information officer in Kenya. How would you like to go to Jamaica? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I have to, have to ask my wife. And anyway, we agreed eventually. And so I went to Jamaica as a kind of journalist for the government, information uh -huh. editing uh, news, government news and stuff. And I did that for, well, it was a four year posting. Mm. And. Um, what years were were that? Was that? Nine sixty, fifty nine or sixty, and we just had oh. the second child, Tim. And um, yeah, well, we had this, we had this second child, Tim. Yeah, and so we got our, we were put on a banana boat uh, with the two kids and Margaret, and off we went to Jamaica. How was and that? I was the last person who should... What? How was, I was it? I was the last person. Who, how what? How was what? Jamaica? Well... Um, but wait, you're saying you were the last person. You were the last person what? I was the last person who should have been a civil servant for a start. And all, I made all my... The friends I started to make... <coughs> When I got to Jamaica, I was running around with the rebellious people, running uh -huh. around with with um, uh, other journalists and artists and poets and all that stuff. And um, so I also, I, 
they seconded me off for a few months to Trinidad from Jamaica, where I became friends with um, with uh, Derek Walcott, who later won the Nobel Prize for poetry. And um, but I was running around with him, and I was running around with those kind of people. Mm. And um, I'd also <laughs> was running around with all kinds of women. <laughs> Because hmm. in Jamaica, everybody just fucks all the time. And, uh, hmm. and uh, uh, it was too easy for me to pick up a girl and, and, and just go and fuck her in the car. And um, it, it, it had no relationship feeling at all. It was just I was cutting loose from all the stuff that had, had held me down in England. You know, it, right. it was just... Right. Just an explosion of that kind of energy, and um, and how was Margaret doing? Well, she she was always very good, and she was totally praised by everybody for what a good hostess she was. And we ran press conferences when English vis- vi- journalists came visiting, and she was she did very very well. I had no complaints about her, except that. She wasn't sexy in the way I wanted women to be sexy, and um, mm-hmm. and so um, uh, I was meantime following up the rebellious thing, getting very friendly with the man who edited the um, uh, local weekly progressive paper called. Um, public opinion. Uh, this guy had founded the Labour Party, the Socialist Party in the, in Jamaica, along with Norman Manley, who became Prime Minister. So uh, Oti Fairclough, very, very black guy. The, he was the blackest guy I've ever, I've ever seen. Um, uh, we became very friendly. And he was trying to start a daily paper in in Jamaica, the big paper is called the Gleaner, and it's about as thick as the New York Times. It's a huge, thick, money-making paper, and it's been yeah. around forever. And and Fairclough, having started the Socialist Party, it's not called the Socialist; it's called the People's National Party. But, and uh, Manley became prime minister, um, and was prime minister at that time. But I got friendly with Fairclough, and he wanted to start an opposition daily paper to take on the Gleaner. And since I had production experience on daily papers, uh, he he and I got along pretty well. Now, wait a minute. Which country is this? Is this Trinidad now? No, this is Jamaica. You're still in Jamaica. Yeah. I I just went for a couple of months to Trinidad. Oh, oh, I see. All right. It was just, I was seconded me. for a couple of months. Yeah. And went and talked. Anyway, there's other stories about that, but never mind. Yeah. But, but, um, so Fairclough and I got along, and so I decided I would help him start his daily paper, even though I had a four year contract with the British government. And, um, the Daily Mirror. <laughs> The Daily Mirror in London, big tabloid paper, gave Fairclough one of those huge newspaper printing machines you see in photographs sometimes. They just gave it to him so we could get started as a daily paper. And so I resigned from the British government. They were glad to see me go because they'd heard about all this running around I was doing. And it mm-hmm. just wasn't my kind of personality you know, to be doing what they wanted, um, meeting all the right people. I was just meeting the journalists and the and the, and, and the artists and, and what have you, and and the Rastafarians. <laughs> My good friend John <laughs> right. took me to, took me to a Rastafarian camp one time. So I was in that. Was there, you know, had you smoked any marijuana there? No, I didn't smoke it, but everybody else did. But, oh, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, I was still in, 
in one corner of my my psyche, um, still very Methodist and um, and uh, wouldn't do all those things. I did, I've never drunk a lot of alcohol or, or done drugs or stuff like that. I've always mm-hmm. been kind of a Methodist. <laughs> uh-huh. And um, that saved you a lot of trouble. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Yes. And one thing that did save me, save me from trouble. And so, anyway, I resigned from the British government. Margaret went home. Um, the government paid to get her home. I stayed on for a bit. And now, when you say she went home, but she wasn't well, leaving the marriage? Not, not, not quite yet. All right, go on. But, but, um, uh, so I stayed on and became BBC correspondent in Jamaica and also writing for Fairclough, writing a weekly column in uh-huh. and stuff like that. And, um, and then after two or three months, I went back to England to, to be with Margaret and the kids and, um, we lived in a caravan near London for a while, in a, in a, in a what you don't call them caravans now, but, but anyway, in, a, in that. Caravan. What do you call them now? Well, trailer, whatever you call. Uh huh. Today's to be a trailer. So we were living with a couple of kids like that, and I was work- Oh, and I, I walked into the Daily Herald, which was the socialist daily newspaper in London, told them what we were trying to do in Jamaica. And they gave me a job uh, immediately, even though I hadn't been in working for a paper for three or four years. But they just gave me a job to help support me. And um, uh, and so then Fairclough sent me a telegram to say, we're ready to start. He'd got it, this big machine set up, and big printing machine and stuff like that. And so, come on back. And he sent me the fares and the money and stuff like that. And uh, so Margaret went to say goodbye. This is getting very dramatic at this point. Margaret went to... um, Gee, I I hope you're going to edit this down, David, because it's getting very long. Um, Yeah. Margaret went back to say goodbye to her parents with the kids and uh, before sailing back to Jamaica. Yeah. And um, and uh, I kept on working for the Daily Herald at night. It was a night job. Going home at midnight kind of thing. The morning paper, and um, going home one night, uh, there was this woman at the bus stop, and I picked off asked her if she wanted to ride. And um, I was still picking women up in those days, and I asked her if she wanted to ride. And uh, we hit it off. I, I liked her when she got into the car. And so to cut this story short, three days later, I phoned Margaret and said, it's all over. I'm out of here. I've met somebody else. <sighs> and um, uh, it turned out this person was a poet, Laura Ulewitz. I didn't know it at the time, but she just won what's called the Guinness Poetry Award, something T.S. Eliot had won before she did. Mm. An important award. And she was a, a former beatnik poet in, the, in North Beach. And then she'd mm. gone to England to meet English poets. Mm. And uh, she'd been, she was in a very big, well-known public relationship with Jack Gilbert who became a famous poet in America. And uh, anyway, Laura and I spent a whole week in bed. 
<laughs> and I was so impressed by the way she ran her life and the w careful way she typed her manuscripts, very detailed, mindful. I'd never seen anybody be mindful in my mm. life. It was totally alien to the way I'd lived my life. But I was just so impressed, I decided I have to change my life to be like this. Mm. And uh, so Margaret said, no, I, I, I told Margaret, look, you don't go back to Jamaica. I've met this other person. And she said, I'm going back to Jamaica. So I put her on the ship. She, would, she wouldn't not go. I put her on, on, the, on the banana boat with um, the two kids. Uh, it's a week's, week's journey to Jamaica. And I was going to keep on working for another week at the Herald and, um, and then fly out. And uh, so that's what happened. I, I told uh, my father's, my mother's um, her sister, who aunt, my aunt, that what I was happening to my marriage, that I was ending it. And um, I mean, it was all it was all kind of crazy, you know, really just crazy. But that, 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 I just decided I have to change my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, crazy though that was. And so anyway, back we, we got back into Jamaica. I got my own house. Margaret got her own house. And, and, um, and uh, let's see if I can shorten this. After a, a few months... Laura said she would join me in Jamaica. Oh. Yeah, I know. And and so she came out to Jamaica and met she wanted to go and tell Margaret I think I think they met anyway. I think she told Margaret that she had no intention of taking me away from my marriage at all. And that was never Laura's wish at all. But Anyway, she came and lived with me in Jamaica for a while. Mm -hmm. And then she managed to save enough money. She hadn't been able to get a ticket to get back otherwise. But I, I paid her ticket to get to Jamaica. And um, uh, she managed to get enough money together to get herself to Miami from Jamaica. And then she hitchhiked back to San Francisco, mm. where all her friends were, and her life was, and stuff like that. <clears throat> and um, after a few more months, Fairclough found that he couldn't start the paper, the daily paper. It wasn't going to work out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just said, well, I'm going to go to San Francisco. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so that's what I did. And, and what year there. was this? What year was this? 64. Ah, so you arrived in San Francisco in 64. Good year. Wow. Which was when he, two years before his Ashby happened. Right. That's true. And that's and when Laura I came. I Haight came Ashbury. two years later. She, she was living there in the yeah. Ashbury. Oh, she was. In 64? What? She well, was living there in... Before, before the, all the hippies developed. Uh -huh. they, they were beginning to be there. But anyway, um, uh, when she... I met her coming home from some date she'd had with some guy. So I, anyway, I took the... First of all, I, I flew to Central America and found my way through... Central America to Honduras and Mexico and took a greyhound to San Francisco. Mm. And and um, I came in through El, El Paso. And um, 
and uh, that morning, the morning I arrived, I went to find, I'd managed to find some address for Laura. I didn't know where she was living, but I'd found some address. Maybe a friend had told me something or other. I don't know. But anyway, I had an address. But she wasn't at home when I had knocked on the door at six in the morning or whatever time it was. And I went out on the street, had a cup of coffee, and I was walking along Haight Street and ran into Laura on her way home from whoever she spent the night with. <laughs> and she said, what are you doing here? Because <laughs> the last thing she wanted was, to, you know, pull me away from this marriage. Mm. And um, But anyway, we got back together and... I lived in her apartment for a while with her there. Meantime, she was... And was this in the height? In the height, yeah. An apartment over near the flower shop. And then Laura started the I Thou coffee shop, which became famous. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where she was founded, it? Where was it? It was opposite near the... Well, it was almost when you get to... Stanion Street, uh -huh. almost in the park. And anyway, uh -huh. she found she founded that. Uh -huh. But we, she and I were breaking up. It was, you know, she was she never envisaged a long term relationship with us. I think. Yeah. And um. And uh, I got my own apartment on Downey Street, just off Eighth Street. And mm -hmm. a couple of times. A couple of times I uh, uh, got jobs on the San Francisco Examiner as a as a copy editor, sub editor mm -hmm. just to make a bit of money. Because oh, actually, Laura and, and and I and Jack Gilbert, her former lover, uh, who was a well-known poet, and um, we all we formed a cooperative selling full of brush. <laughs> So we were all traipsing around down <laughs> San Francisco uh, selling full of brush and um, uh, but I, I, I worked a couple of times for six months or so for the uh, San Francisco Examiner to make a bit of money because I was living on nothing or more or less selling full of brushes and, um, and that gave me enough money to make a trip back to England to see the kids because it just broke my heart, of course. I mean, I it was terrible leaving the kids, and um, and so I did. And I went to see them, and I saw Margaret, and um, just for a few days, and uh, rather uh, pointedly, Margaret said when we met outside the house, I guess you know I could tell the, call the police. It had never once crossed my mind that I was supposed to be supporting her and the kids. I gave her every penny I had. I gave her my car, all the furniture, everything. You know, I, I was left completely moneyless. Um, but uh, she never tried. We divorced in the meantime, and she, she she had never tried to get me to support her. And she got a good job, a librarian teaching librarian, I think, at Leeds University. And um, she became quite known. Um, she uh, became a consultant for UNESCO on children's libraries and wrote uh, six or seven books about children's mm. libraries. And, um, but, we, but, but she and I, it was finished. It was completely finished. And I went back to San Francisco after just a few days and uh, got married again, a young woman of 19, age 19, <laughs> who we'd met on Haight Street. And the marriage lasted for two months. <laughs> and, yeah. and, then, and then it folded. So I, you ask me about my difficulties, you can, you've got the picture to some extent that uh, I just had no real sense of, you know, how to how to have a life. Yeah. And, um, 
And uh, and she was oh boy, that was all. Uh, what was her name? Can't even think of her name. Um, she uh, <laughs> became in, uh, very involved with Esalon. Oh, the, the people who later took over Green Gorge. No, uh, no, 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 no. Not Esalon. No, not Esalon. I'm sorry. Her sister worked at Esalon as, as a something or other. Right. Um, um, what was the name of the outfit, the, the, drug, the, the anti-drug outfit? Um, oh, Synanon. That's right, Synanon. That's right. Synanon didn't take over Green Gulch. Yeah, they took over at Green Gulch, right? No. N- yeah. In, no. Uh, the, the Synanon was up in Marshall. California, yeah, up up Highway One, right. Uh, it uh, George Wheelwright did before he gave Green Gulch to Zen Center, yeah. he did give it to Synanon, but right. but uh, they took it back right away. Yeah, I because, know. I, I helped clean the place up when they left with Bill Lane. I I did that. That was part of what I did at, some, at Zen Center. Uh huh. Before going before I went to Tassajara. Uh-huh. Three or four or five of us used to go out on weekends to Green Gulch to clean the place up after after Synanon. And hmm. um, but anyway, Ellen, my second wife, uh, liked Synanon because of its its encounter group. Yeah, the game they called it. Francisco. Uh, yeah, and uh, right. And she was into that and tried to get me to be in it. And it was just antithetical to anything I wanted or liked. Or yeah, of. right. It was brutal. <laughs> oh, right, absolutely. But she talked me into going there. And so I was just bouncing around from friend to friend and staying with with friends to get, get on a couch and all kinds of stuff at this point. I was really bouncing around, and so I, then I went to Sinanon and where signed where? in. Where signed, it, um, it was somewhere down in the, the uh, in San Francisco. Um, right. I forget. It. I forget what it's yeah, called. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, they had a big house. Yeah. And and so I I I, I went there, signed up. I had to say I took drugs in order to be accepted. I guess I'd had about two marijuana joints and a couple of LSDs by that point. But that was it. I didn't do drugs. But I told them I did in order to be accepted. And so that I could <laughs> so that I could see Ellen. And she was trying to make this marriage work. But we'd, we'd split up by then after only two months together. Her sister was, was at Esalen by the way, but that's a different part of the story. But, mm-hmm. um, so, so, um, I went to my, I went to uh, uh, and it was immediately obvious to me, this is a crazy place, no place for me. And after about two days, I discovered an unlocked downstairs back door. <laughs> And I snuck out through the door and never went back. And I had no money. Oh, it must have been in in Oakland, this house. I think it was in Oakland. Uh Because I found myself in Oakland without a single penny in my pocket because you didn't have any. You didn't own anything in cinema. And I had to, it was the only time I've ever done any, I've ever panhandled. (laughs) I panhandled the fair to San Francisco uh-huh. and um, landed up with an artist friend in San Francisco. Him and his wife put me up for the night. And, uh, yeah, and um, so what that turned into was I was bouncing around. I started 
selling newspapers on the street or something. Yeah. And um, delivering newspapers, and I don't know what I was doing. But uh, also Jack Gilbert and his friend that meantime sold me the weed patch, which was a tobacco store on Hate Street, Hate and Masonic. Wait a minute. They sold you, bought a store, you didn't have a cent. You're panhandling, well, you're selling newspapers, and then you buy a store. <laughs> well, I, they gave it to me almost for nothing. Oh, and my father, meantime, who had not quite, he was to die a few years later, but he sent, he, maybe he died already. And he, no, no, he, he, I told him I was trying to start a business. Mm -hmm. which was more along kind of the kind of thing he'd want me to do. And uh, he gave me a few hundred dollars, and I bought the weed patch. You bought a store to... on, on Hate Street for $300? I didn't, it wasn't much, maybe 600 But All right. I, it was enough to get me to pay the rent. I had to pay a rent for it. I didn't, it, but... But it was it was it was a famous tobacco store, <laughs> the Weed Patch, sold uh -huh. bonds, gold wars and stuff well, like that. Uh huh. What? Yeah. Uh, uh, did you sell uh, that Turkish cigarette that yeah. I like so much? Um, God, what was that called? I, I can't think of the name. Uh, oh wow! But yeah, and uh, a remarkable <laughs> taste. Um, what year? Well, that was. That was uh, maybe sixty-eight or nine, something oh, like that. Oh, really? Oh, you're getting that late? All it was right. just before I got to. No, it must have been earlier than that. It was. It was during the end of the hippie thing, so the hippie thing was sort of thriving in sixty-six, seven, around there. It was at its peak. Yeah. Right. And. Um, and it was just beginning to die out and become rough. And uh, but it was still happening. Well, in the and hate, I, in the hate, yeah, and it it spread. Out. I mean, it's yeah. still going. <laughs> but, no, but you know, but I mean, the, the throngs of hippies, just right, full right, of people, was in was around about that time. Yeah, and um, uh, the weed patch had been a something of a head shop when uh, Jean who was Jack Gilbert's buddy was running it and um, uh, but I didn't sell any any uh, head shops so just I, I think I sold things like hash pipes but not the actual drugs <laughs> along with the foreign cigarettes yeah. and this few months and uh, meantime, Alan was off on this thing, and we completely split up by then. And then I've completely freaked out, running, trying to run this store. And um, I got a job to try and help with the money with Shrevage Lock <laughs> in San Francisco. And the people that make the locks and... Uh, in, in the Mission District or somewhere. And uh, they fired me. And um, I just lost it. And I went and walked into Mount Zion Hospital one day and I said, um, I need help. Mm -hmm. and the doctor said, well, I'm sorry. You know, we talked. And he said, I'm sorry. We just don't have any beds. And I said, well, I, I really need need a place to come to for help. And he said, well, we don't have anywhere. And I said, well, look, when I walk out of your office here, <clears throat> I don't know whether I'm going to turn left or right. And you've got to, you can put me in a cupboard. <laughs> so he made a phone call and he said, okay, I found a bed for you. And they put me on the terminal ward where all the people were dying 
<laughs> During the night, they kept wheeling people out when they died. <laughs> oh, God. I remember waking, waking up and seeing them wheeling people out. And um, and they kept, so they, they now kept me in the psychiatric department uh, for two or three months. Really? A month or, I just, some, anyway, some weeks. I don't know how long. And meantime, managed to get for me ATD or whatever you called it. Anyway, money. Aid to the totally disabled, ATD. Yeah. Well, anyway, Johnson was doing his his, uh, his, his thing. And it was throwing money at people to help, you know, poor people at that time. And so they gave me <laughs> lifetime. They made a they made a diagnosis that I was critically um, depressed, uh, cr critical depression, and um, clinically depressed. Uh, cl I was. It was called. I think it's called critical. After it's next to the critically absolute, depressed. Yeah. Uh-huh, all right. I th th there's a technical word, but anyway, they gave me whatever that is, ATD or whatever it is, for life. <laughs> they told me they would support me for the rest of my life. And, um, and then after some weeks in the psychiatric ward, they put me in a halfway house where you went to daycare and played ping pong all day and stuff like that, and uh, and and all the other people, both in the psychiatric ward and in the halfway house, everybody was a drug addict except me. Oh, <laughs> but I was in for depression. And hmm. after a year in the halfway house, uh, I was turned loose. And I went through two or three apartments in a few weeks. And um, I had this, eventually got this good apartment somewhere in the, anyway, it doesn't matter where. But, but um, <clears throat> with this guy who was a photographer, a good photographer, who was having an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art mm -hmm. of, his, of his work. And um, he could still tell I was still in pretty bad shape. And um, one day he said, you know, you should go and listen to Suzuki Roshi. And um, he wasn't particularly a Zen Buddhist, but, but he was kind of into that kind of thing. He said, mm -hmm. you should go and listen to, to Suzuki Roshi. I'd never heard of Suzuki Roshi or anything. I'd been doing yoga with Indian gurus, trying to, and looking for a commune mm -hmm. while I was bouncing around at this time, looking for any, you know, a suitable commune, and nothing appealed to me at all. But he said, you, you should go listen to Suzuki Roshi. So I did. And I immediately felt Zen Center is right. When was and, this? Um, this would be 69, I guess. Might have been 70, but I think it was 69. Six, 69. Well, where did you hear him speak? Uh, at, at Page Street for the next few months. All right. Well, at Page Street, they moved in to Page Street it was uh, in Street. November yes. of 69. Well, in that case, it was 1970. Uh-huh. It wasn't immediately after they moved. But so I, I, uh, I got an apartment with Bill Benz. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Yeah, just um, next, just one block down from from three hundred page, just across the street. And um, and I lived with Bill Benz for a few years, no, for a few months, and uh, and eventually moved into Page Street. Yeah, because I, I by this time I was sitting with regular Zazu, and um, uh, Suzuki Roshi was still alive, and then Baker Roshi came back, 
in, I don't know, August or something like that. No, and, Bank um, Banker came back in... Uh, July? Oh boy, no, no, but more like October. It was right. It, 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 oh, uh, it was right before. Okay, well, anyway, he yeah. came back. And Bill Ben said you should go to <clears throat> talk to Baker Roshi. And I met him and uh, see, to see if he could give me a help in getting a job as a copywriter for a publisher. Bill Ben said he's just wrote this book and he knows publishers. And so we talked, but he wasn't able to help me. But he took me up to his room and blah, blah, blah. And um, and then there was Sashin in that November, or end of November or December, whatever, when Suzuki Roshi died. Yeah, that was December uh, 4th was okay, the well, first was, day of that, that Sashin. That was my first day of Sashin. When he died, I was sitting in the passageway uh, not like, you know, in the main zendo, the passageway leading to the back door there. Right. And um, and then he died, and I became Baker Roshi's student. And a few months later, he said, Silas met me and said, he thinks you should get ordained. And um, uh, I got lay ordination. Well, I, that meant I started throwing a rack suit. And then yeah. uh, I worked for the work company with Bill Smith. Yeah. Um, building building a house somewhere, and um, uh, and then I guess it was in '72 then that I went to Tazahara. Anyway, I, I don't know if it was '72 or '73. Must have been. I'm not sure. I don't know. There was some period when I was working for the work company. <clears throat> well, that work company started in 72. I mean, that was happening in 72. It didn't yeah. last very long. I think it might have been only in 72. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, I went in January, January 20, 72 or 73. I'm not no, sure. you went January went to, 73 to... 73 uh, then, I went to Tassar. I went, yeah, that's right. I went to Tassajar. Meantime, I'd been working weekends with Bill Lane at uh, Green Gulch, cleaning the place up. And um, and I was slowly settling down. Bill Lane, when he was at Page Street, taught me how to bake bread. He used to bake all the bread. Uh-huh. At uh, Page Street. And he taught me to bake. And... Um, so, yeah, um, my life was, you know, it, it had taken shape. Mm -hmm. It had suddenly had shape to it. And um, and so I did a couple of years at Tassajara, three, three practice periods and uh, guest season. And then... Yeah, we were together. Said, we were together yes. that time. Right. Because you went in 73, and I was there 74 and 75 as uh, head monk and then director. Uh-huh. Well, I, you were head monk. Anyway, I was, in the September, I was told by Baker Roshi he wanted me to go to Green Gulch. Mm. And so I, I moved to Green Gulch, and I was there for... I don't know, until about 82. Oh. Oh, yeah. no, no, 80, 80, maybe 80. And then I went to, I met Anita at Green Gosh, and we got together, and she was living at Page Street after being at Green Gosh. And so then they asked me to work at the Green Grocer. And I, uh -huh. lived in Page Street. I lived in Page Street again. And uh, after she and I, I think we'd sort of broken up, I'm not sure whether we'd totally broken up, but but um, I felt I needed to go back to Tassajara. Um, after the chaos of being with Anita, um, I felt I had to go back to Tassajara. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
I did that for another year or two, and I was there with Peter Overton as Su Shu So when um, when the shit hit the sun. Oh, you mean when when uh, Baker, when Baker had, had a falling out, let's say, with yes. uh, the yes. uh, community? Yes, and I was. Peter Overton That's eighty three. Eighty three. Well, Peter was the Shuso at that time when all that was happening, and um, <clears throat> or it might have been guest season following his being Shuso. But anyway, um, uh, I was after that happened. I was still there the following year, Tassahara, because I remember Reb coming one time to kind of help people and doing a, a, a big meeting in one of the cabins. And um, he started out the meeting by singing um, uh, from uh, one of the musicals, um, Hush, Little Baby, Don't You Cry. <laughs> and, uh, uh, what's the name of that musical? Um, but, P P P Porgy, is it Porgy? Oh, you mean Porgy, Porgy and Bess? I think so. I think, yeah. And uh, he was very, it was very moving for everybody. Um, that uh, uh, we were all very emotional, being break up happening and all that stuff, and then. Then um, I went back to Green Gulch and I was given some responsibilities there, sort of looking. It was all in chaos, as you know. It was Everything was changing. And um, uh, well, I was the person asked to help with all the guest students who were flooding in. Um, and uh, and so I was I was you know, sort of crew le crew leader for that <clears throat> for uh, I don't know for for some months and then uh, I was in charge of the chickens. Uh -huh. the Green Gulch. I remember after, that after after Stan White left, I did the chickens for a year or two, and then in about eighty. Five. Uh, I wanted to go back to Tassahara again, and I did. And um, I was getting very, very angry with the community. Mm. But what I saw happening as being political, and everybody was out for themselves, and all these people I'd known were suddenly becoming. Roches and all kinds of high, big mucky muck jobs at Kring at uh, uh, at, uh, at Sen Center, and I, I I know I got into some kind of trouble for planting a garden around my cabin at Tassahara, and I wasn't supposed to. The gardeners were supposed to do it. Oh, Bo, come on. That's ridiculous. Well, we ne there was something to do with the garden. Really? That, well, usually didn't. people could do whatever they wanted around their cabins. Well, you know? whatever happened, they didn't like what I was doing. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Well, I, the, those things change, you know, and and uh, they, it'll go through periods where, you know, there'll be that sort of thing happening. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so anyway, go on. they they, they uh, eventually one day I was told by uh, what's her name who was the president uh, was in Santa Leslie. Uh, Leslie, I think she was the director, and she said she'd give me a ride to San Francisco, and that and told, uh, oh I thought I'd be going back to Green Gulch. Before I left Green Coach, Norman, who was the director, had promised me that I could go to 
to Sahara and have a practice period and get my job back as head of, uh, head of the chickens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, anyway, Leslie drove me to Page Street and as I walked through the door, Yvonne was, caught me and put $400 in my hand and said, you have to leave. And uh, that was the end of it. And um, so huh. I went down the hill. Yeah, exactly like that. I That is astounding. I've never heard of anything like that. Oh, yeah, well, Yvonne, I mean, it was very clear. And it was very short and sweet. She just gave me $400, and they said, you have to leave. And um, I don't think I was even told that I'd been behaving badly. I was just left to accept the fact and figure it out for myself. Wow. But, yeah. I don't remember any of that. And that was after that, what? All right. Uh, now, wait that a minute. Was after, that so, was after so, All right. Well, well, Norman became director of Green Gulch in 86, January, like right then. Uh, I'd been uh, interim director before him just uh, to help out when it was just sort of falling apart. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, that sounds like it was 86. Uh, uh, I don't know if there were still chickens. Were there still chickens? They got rid of the chickens pretty soon. They might have done it, but I'm not sure. But, uh, but I remember, I remember... Um, yeah, I think there were still chickens, but they got okay, they, they yeah, eliminated yeah, the chickens maybe after they were a while. About to, to give up on them, but I I went so I, I'd gone down to the uh, hotel down on Market Street, a terrible place, and um, I remember sitting zazen. I've just been thrown out of Page Street. But, uh, so and, strange, uh, man. It's what? And said that it's so strange. Yeah, well, but that is exactly how it happened. Well, and, uh, now wait. You could have stayed in the neighborhood and sat at Zen Center. Nobody is told they can't sit in the yeah. Zendo unless they're violent or something, you know. I don't think that anything further was said. I didn't yeah. pursue that. You just couldn't. They were just saying you're, you're not going to be supported by Zen Center. You don't have a job here anymore. And uh, right. that's right. the way it was told you. Hmm, yeah. not cool. Well, I, 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 but all I on. remember is get, getting the four hundred bucks, and that's I just so went strange. down the hill and got a room. Wow! Yeah. And uh, it was a terrible place. Uh, I remember sitting zazen in the room and ra a rat jumping over my knees. <laughs> <laughs> it was a terrible place, and uh, an S and M couple in the next room. I would hear that um, wow. <laughs> all times a day. Anyway, it was obvious I had to find some job. Yeah. And I got a job driving a taxi, driving a yellow cab in South San Francisco. And um, I went back to Green Ghost one day and saw Norman. And I said, Norman, you promised me I don't have, could have my job back. So I... He met me in the car, in the parking lot. Norman? And I said, Norman, you promised me I'd get my job back. And, uh, of course, the board had been talking about me, apparently, in San Francisco. But, but I said, you, you promised. And he, he, was so, he was so cool. <laughs> I've loved this remark ever since. At that time, of course, I was completely flattened. But he said... I lied. <laughs> I said, you promised me I'd get my job back. He said, I lied. And so, um, among the various chaotic things that happened around about this time, I, I got this job driving a yellow cab and I was taking all kinds of funny jobs. Um, <clears throat> cleaning urinals for a, in Mill Valley and all kinds of weird stuff. And I got, at one point, 
I went to live in one of the stables or cow huts um, on the hills around Green Gulch. <laughs> and, uh, uh, oh, well, you, that would be the stables at, at Muir Beach. Um, right? The stables at Muir, at Muir Beach. No, no, this was above the parking lot in, at, at Green Gulch. Above the parking lot? The parking lot, yeah. There's uh, stables? There's, there's some kind of a cow hut with a trough in it. Oh, yeah, okay, uh, okay, all right. And uh, so I'd, I had a sleeping bag, a good expensive one, which I'd bought when I was at Green Gulch, I think. And I was sleeping there and going off to this job clear, cleaning urinals in Mill Valley. Huh. The day. And I came back. Well, wait a minute. Uh, How did you get to Mill Valley? I uh, uh, Somehow or other, I had got a, an old truck. I uh -huh. forget exactly how. I had an old truck. And, Was it um, a Chevy? I've forgotten. I've, I've forgotten. I just don't know. Don't think so. Might have been. I don't know. Yeah. But I came home one night. And I found the sleeping bag had been removed from the cow shed. And somebody had put a backpack there. <laughs> Very heavy, heavy hint <laughs> that uh, they, they, took the, they took the sleeping bag and gave me, gave me a, a backpack. And so I took the hint and um, moved on. And I think I lived in that truck driving around Marin County for some weeks. That might have been my truck. That might have been my truck. Uh, I, I don't think so. But No? Because I, I passed so. my truck on to somebody at Green Gulch. You know. Uh-huh. No, I, I don't think so. Yeah. But anyway, uh, sort, of, sort of working and sleeping around anywhere I could that particular summer. At, at uh, state parks and campgrounds and the back of the truck or whatever. Well, wait a minute. They oh, took your sleeping bag. Did you get it back? No. Um, uh, no. I think yeah. I, try, I went down to the barn and looked in, looked at the Goodwill. and there was. But I, no, I didn't. I, I just took the hint that I wasn't one meant to be around there. And whoever it was had spotted me going up there in the evenings. Might have been Norman. I don't know. It could have been somebody else. But anyway, I took the hint and then went traveling for wherever. I got a job doing uh, Meals on Wheels, serving in some somewhere, I don't know, um, in San Rafael. I don't know. No, don't know where it was. It doesn't matter. But um, but I was, I remember I was thrown out of a few state parks because I'd been there too often and things yeah. like that. And um, but anyway, I was on the road pretty much. And um, uh, eventually managed to to get back to Page Street and talk Reb into letting me go to Tassahara uh -huh. Uh -huh. for a practice period. No kidding. <laughs> and, All right, what, uh, year is uh, what year is this? I don't, I don't, I don't think I could figure it out. Uh, somehow, also need to work into this period. I got an apartment. In, I, I started going to. I was obviously, I, I didn't feel connected or, fr or welcome at, at Page Street. I must have just felt, you know, they'd, they'd cut me off. Right. And, Understandable. And, and so I, I, I went to Boulder. Bol Boulder. Wait a minute. You talked no, to Rev Boulder. about going to a practice period, but no, you didn't do no, it? Wait, just a minute. Yeah. Not Boulder, but Berkeley. Oh, Berkeley. Berkeley. All right. Yeah. I went to Berkeley, 
and uh, started sitting at Berkeley Zen Center and got an apartment at Berkeley Zen Center. Uh, well, some of the time they let me live there for a few nights, and then I got an apartment in Oakland, near 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 Berkeley, and um, uh, so I don't quite know. That must have been toward the end of this kind of episode. But I remember Blanche and he, Blanche and Lou came to visit me in my apartment and gave me this nice thing I still have on the wall here, a piece of um, calligraphy from a Heiji. Mm. But, um, but I also, I was sleeping around because I was in, sometimes in the place at the end of the bridge, for, for, I don't know what it's called, near, near Oakland, um, Anyway, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> but I was, I was um, bouncing around, and uh, at some point, decided. Oh, yeah. At some point, I found myself in Marshall, um, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, in a place I rented on a dairy farm and I got a job driving a van delivering pharmaceuticals all over uh, that part of California um, all the way to uh, as far as uh, oh anyway all around and um at some point, round about then, I, that's when I talked. At one time, Reb into letting me go to Tassajara for a practice period. And then the following year, I talked Mel into letting me go to Tassajara for a practice period. And um, So you you were at Tassajara then for at yeah, least... Yeah, th this would be about 88, round about then. Yeah. And, uh, so, did you just stay at Tassajara for a year or two there? No, for two practice periods, two separate practice periods. Uh huh. And, and uh, because I'd, be, I'd got to know Mel a bit, and uh, w uh, the way I came to leave Berkeley, because I'd been in Ber before this, I'd been in Berkeley, and. Uh, I had a falling out with one of the students there, uh, an, an unusual kind of guy, who uh, a very strange guy, and um, he got into. And then I rented a room with him after I'd left my apartment and left Berkeley Zen Center, and he, he had a fight with me. He actually deliberately attacked me. <laughs> And I picked him up, and I threw him across the room. Huh. So apparently, I'm pretty strong, even though I was never kind of that kind of person. But I was kind of very strong. And um, so Mel had to talk to me after that about my about violence. And. Um, So I, uh, that's when I left Berkeley and went to the dairy farm in Marshall. Definitely, mm. that's right. That would be 88. And I lived in Marshall for a couple of years mm. before mm. eventually, and my life was a little bit stable when I had this driving job delivering pharmaceuticals and I had a, a, a place to sleep. And... Um, and my son, Tim, came to see me with his girlfriend, his, now his wife, um, it, 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 while I was there. And um, so I, at this point, got in touch with Baker Roshi in Crestone, 
Oh, there's one little bit I've missed out. Earlier, earlier, at some point, a few years earlier, uh, I had, when, when I was feeling this two camps thing of, in, 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 in Zen Center, the right. Baker Roshi people, and I went to see Baker Roshi in Santa Fe. Oh, mm-hmm. And they were they were doing a sashin when I arrived. I didn't know they were. <laughs> I arrived in the middle of sashin, and so Steve Allen drove me to where Angelique had a a, a, a room, mm-hmm. and they gave they let me stay in Angelique's room because she was doing sashin. Um, for, for a night or two, and then I, I left and I went back to wherever I I was living at that time. I can't quite remember where it was, uh, and um, and uh, then I decided I wanted to see Katagiri Roshi. Me, oh, in the middle of all this stuff. When Katagiri was Abbott, acting Abbott at Zen Center, um, I had Doksan with him, and he told me I could could be ordained as a pri- as a monk, as a priest. Mm. And um, so. Uh, Blanche measured me up for an Okesa. She couldn't believe it. <laughs> she went to check with 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 the category and said, Are you sure you, you're not talking about Raksu for him again? And he said, no, 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 it's Okesa. So we cut the Okesa out, Page Street, and um, I started sewing my Okesa, which is the only one I've got. Still, I've still got it, and uh, I didn't quite finish it. I put it in a box, and when Baker Roshi ordained me in uh, in uh, 2015, a few years ago, five six years ago, um, we dug it out and uh, finished the Okesa, or somebody helped me to finish it, and um, that's the Okesa I have actually. Hmm. But that came from Katagiri. And so I, I already had established something with Katagiri. And now I went by Amtrak to see a Katagiri in uh, Minnesota and uh, met a few of his people there and stayed in, in, in a, a storage room there. And... Um, yeah, so there was that also happened. It's one of the things that happened in the interim period, and I'm not quite sure what the years would be for that. But you didn't go through with the ordination with Katagiri. Why was that? I think it was that it just didn't make sense. He was in back in Minnesota. Yeah, he he'd left, and uh, it just didn't. And we we still felt on good terms. It was very, very good to me when I was in Minnesota, but it was clearly there was nothing happening because I had no real way of. I, as far as I understood it, I would have had to go to because it wasn't true, but I think I th- probably thought I'd have to go and live in Minnesota, and it just didn't make any kind of sense. Right. So, um, so we just dropped the subject, and uh, yeah. So uh, you went to Santa Fe and saw Baker there at some point. Yeah, and, right. And then how did how did the trans? So at some point you left the Zen Center, that San Francisco area. Yeah. And and went to Creststone. When was that? Well, so I'm, I'm living now in Marshall, right? Right. In 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 um, <coughs> nineteen <coughs> nineteen ninety, or maybe it's even ninety one. 
and I, I, I got in touch with Baker Roshi and said, could I get back with him? And he said, well, come over and and see if you like it. You know, it's a typical response. And uh, so I did. I drove drove from California to Crestown and stayed for a week. And uh, when I first met Mark and people like that, and uh, then went back to California. And a couple of months later, it must, that must have been in the summer. And around about the September, I I said, yeah, well, I like it. I want to, can I come back? And he said, okay. And uh, so I moved into into uh, the temple at, at Crestone. When? Oh, 91? Well, 91. Yeah. Maybe autumn, maybe September. Ah. Uh. September 19. 19- 91, and I, I lived there for for uh, about a year. The guy who was the director wasn't even a Zen student. He was a leftover person from the... Uh, Lindisfarne uh, Institute. From Lindisfarne, yeah. Huh, really? Uh, yeah, and um, he and I didn't get along. And I kind of resented the fact that he didn't practice Zen or something. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't seem right to me. I mean, I had very, very closed ideas about Zen and Zen practice and what it was all supposed to be like. Yeah. You know, very, very, very closed. And um, so one day I was having some teeth done in the dentist in Moffat. And I was lying there. He'd already given me my injections, the dentist. <laughs> and I heard him on the phone because um, there was an apartment behind the dentist office and uh, he, he had a tenant there and he was talking with her and it got rather heated and bad-tempered. And it was clear that he, he wasn't going to have that same tenant. So I, <laughs> when he came back to the dental chair I said well, I'll rent it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I handed I said I said uh, 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 Crystal I wasn't terribly happy with the way things were or with my role or something and uh, and so I left and went to live in Moffat and then got a job packing carrots at a farm near center. And um, I did that for a year and then went back to Crestone, got an apartment and decided I would find a way to build a house there, Mm -hmm. which I did. And um, and uh, I started copy editing books for publishers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I might have done a bit of that uh, earlier, but I'm not sure. I can't really remember. But anyway, I was copy editing books and managed to build a house. And um, not this one, but a different one. And uh, started occasionally going to Zen Center to sit Zazen. But mostly sitting on my own, I think, and um, mm-hmm. and over the years, you know, got closer and closer to Zen Baker Roshi again, and uh, sitting with them and doing sessions and stuff like that. You went to Germany, Sam? Oh yeah. Well, I first went to Germany when Geralt invited me. Mm-hmm. He'd been director when I was. First at Green uh, in Crestone. No, no, it couldn't be. Wait a minute, because there was this funny guy I told you about. Well, he before. was director there at some point. He was one. But of anyway, the... he was director there. Yeah. Maybe he left. I don't know. But anyway, uh, um, he was. Uh, he invited me to visit him in 
And I was make I'd started making trips back in nineteen about nineteen ninety two or three or four because I now had a little bit of money doing the book editing. Mm-hmm. Uh, started making trips back to England. First time I'd seen I'd been back. And um, in what, th- how many years? Twenty, thirty years, and um, gone back to that's what. So Geralt, on these trips, Geralt invited me to uh, to Germ- to Johannesdorf, and so I went to see him, and uh, had a nice time, <clears throat> and um, either that time or a subsequent visit, I did a session in Germany. Again, it would be linked up with my visits to my family in England. Mm-hmm. So I, I uh, on one of the visits, Norman Fisher gave a seminar with Baker Roshi in Germany and his, with, uh, with his wife. And um, I, was, I did that seminar with Norman and Baker Roshi. And, uh, but this was all kind of probably very round about the turn of the century. I'm yeah. not sure exactly the dates. And um, more recently, about four years ago, I went to do a whole practice period when Geralt was head monk. Uh, not head monk, was led the practice period. Where? Um, With, in, in Germany? In, in, in Johannesburg. Johannesburg. Yeah. And uh, so I did, I did that and got to know uh, Otmar better and was made very, very, very welcome <coughs> at Johannesburg. Yeah. And fitted in quite well. And um, I, I became the coffee tea person. And uh, that, that, that went very well. And... So the following year, Baker Roshi was doing his final, what was said at that time, uh-huh. his final practice period. And so I went back again for that. And uh, then I went to visit a friend I'd made, um, one of his students there in, in Austria, and spent a week with her. And uh, I really felt very good about relationship with Johannesov and um, but since then I haven't uh, gone back and it became clearer they offered you know to let me go there and live there and said they would work out the medical thing and I, I it was all getting messed up by England UK leaving leaving the European Union and stuff like that. So it kind of got com- more complicated. Kind of the idea of me going there was quite hot at one point. And uh, Nicole was was kind of very friendly and helpful, and so was Otmar. Mm-hmm. But then it began to seem like, like uh, too complicated. And uh, it became more likely that I would continue to live here in this house, and develop more my relationship with Crestone yeah. people again, and um, and uh, oh, me, and in the meantime, I'd also been ordained by Baker Roshi. Of course, I don't really function as as a, as a priest. I function more just as a monk, but um, but I've never I've never functioned with the group much. As, 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 uh, I've never been uh, Doshi, for example. So I, I'm, but, but yeah. I'm recognized as, I'm recognized as a monk. monk you, you've never led a service as the Doshi. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So um, I, I have uh, a question. Um, but do you remember any, do you remember anything in particular about Suzuki Roshi? I, I, I remember asking him a question in the d- dinner 
in the dining room after a lecture one time. But I, I was sort of so either excited or whatever. I just can't remember what I asked him or what he said. You know, I was I was a very new student. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I don't remember. I do remember um, enjoying seeing him in the building and being at meals when he would sit at the top table with the senior students. And... Um, Anybody being, could sit being, there. What? Anybody could sit with him. It wasn't like a table yes. for senior students. Oh, well, it felt like it was always people like, um, like, uh, um, um, yeah. Well, uh, it would be natural for se- senior students to sit yes, with him, yes, but yes. there were there were no assigned seats. No. Okay, but. But it was people like, um, I can't think of his name. <laughs> it was almost the Roshi. Silence. Yeah, it was kind of, that, that, that's what I felt. It was people like Silas and maybe Paul Rosenblum and people like that. Well, Paul was at Tassahara. He was at Tassahara, but maybe he, if he visited, he, but those kind of. People. Yeah, yeah, I see. Right, right. And I was I would be sitting closer to the kitchen, and uh, with the new students, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so what I remember, I do remember his lectures, somewhat. And I, one thing I remember from one of his lectures, which I've looked up since, was the one when he talked about you're all wearing pink spectacles, uh, wearing your ro- your rosy hide. You're oh, wearing you're all uh, wearing uh, uh, rose-colored glasses. That's right, rose-colored glasses. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I mean that made a big impression on me. Huh. And um, uh, that sort of colored my understanding for a long time. It was was uh, to, you know therefore because it follows from that, you have to ask a lot of questions of yourself, you know and. Uh, so that was a big impression on me, but I just liked and enjoyed seeing him. Of course, the way I mean, we, I guess we all did. And I also remember his funeral. I remember him leaving the uh, the uh, mountain sea ceremony. Uh, I was in the lobby when he was helped out, out of the door there. Mm-hmm. What do you and, remember uh, about it? Well, I remember people having to hold him by the elbow, you know, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember Baker Roshi's mountain seat ceremony. And, um, uh, and I remember the, the funeral and uh, how deeply moved everybody was. You know, everybody was sort of in mm. tears, even if we hadn't known him well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. At the at the commission thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Remarkable, if, even on new students, the effect he had. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Dennis, you've had a very interesting life. Uh, <laughs> you said you had a lot of great difficulty, but. Uh, sounds like most of that was just learning how to relate to people. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, uh, and uh, but 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 the developing a career kind of always blew up in my face. Mm-hmm. And uh, everything kind of blew up in my face, including Zen Center. Yeah, you know, it just kind of. Um, yeah, but you've done very well. You've survived. You've, you've, you know, you you've had problems, but you got up. You continued. I think. I think. Yeah. Um, this is a fantastic, uh, quite long Shaggy Dog success story. Yeah, I accept that. Well, I accept that, and that um, uh, it's only been this last 
few years that uh, there's been some recognition that that um, the stuff is beginning to fall away. The bad stuff is falling away, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, that. Uh, you mean recognition on your part? But yeah, on my part, and and the way people relate, relate to me is different too. Uh huh. Uh huh. People, people. I'm now just. I'm just, I don't know, both, not only at Zen Center, but the checkout stand in the supermarket. People, there's no problem, you know. People pick up on me as the being something for them to relate to. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, you know, wonderful for me. Mm. Well, wonderful. yeah. Ha <laughs> ha! Hey, you never said anything about World War II. How did it affect you? <laughs> well, I was at boarding school during that time. Uh huh. Um, we were rationed, so my kind of eating habits are probably <laughs> owe a lot to to that kind of period. And um, I was the person who was paid sixpence a week. To put the blackout curtains up in the school and things uh-huh. like that. Um, uh, I was I kind of followed it with some interest. Once I got into my my teens, I followed things like the North African campaign closely and things like that. Um, once or twice, right at the very beginning, it was before I went to boarding school. I was in Scarborough which is an East Coast town, tourist town, a seaside resort. And it was bombed a bit. And so I was, you know, I would, had to sleep underneath the stairs at my aunt's house where I was living at that time. And uh, she wasn't my aunt, but we called her aunt. And um, uh, so when the sirens went off in the night with the German bombers came overhead, uh, we would uh, not have to go to school next morning if we, you know, if we missed the sleep. Oh, we used to have to go carry gas masks and things to go to school and uh, mm. all, all that kind of thing. Um, and there was one bomb on the street where I was saying oh but it was kind of as kids you know it's just fun we used to I used to want to go out in the street and watch the searchlights trying to find the German bombers that kind of thing kids find it fun and um, there's always the excitement element of it and down at the beach where we used to go and play as kids there were tank traps big, big tank traps that were built to stop the Germans landing troops there and uh, that kind of thing. So it was kind of an excitement thing. Mm. Uh, wow, yeah. I, well, well yeah. you've had a long and interesting life. Ah, my doorbell just rang. I know who it is. These days, I'm much happier when I speak more mindfully and that was none of that was mindful. Speech, ah, but, well, um, good, good. You let it all hang out. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, quite a journey. <laughs> I recognize that was not mindful speech. Oh, I certainly will. And um, <laughs> look, you continue being mindful, and um, I'll do my best. And I hope we meet again someday, Dennis. Yeah. Well, when, if you're in Crestone. Make sure you come by. Oh, yeah. I always do. Unless I may be, I may be out since then. To, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, and if you're in Bali, drop by. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that would be nice. Yeah. Well, it's been great talking with okay. you, and we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. Yep. Thank you very Good. much, and take care. Enjoy the vacation. Yeah. Enjoy the coming festivities. Oh, yeah. Happy holidays, Dennis. 
You too. All right. Yep. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, David. Hey, Dennis. Thanks a lot. Wow. What a trip. I I do know that since he did this podcast, Chris Stone, he and Chris Stone uh, have uh, continued negotiations about him building a place there. They are naturally concerned, and all groups are, with uh, taking on someone uh, with their limited resources who they might have to be taking care of in uh, for a long time. And he told me that. He, he understands that. He says that, you know, they only feel they, they have enough resources to deal with Richard Baker, who's in his uh, mid-80s. But he's going strong. Dennis is going strong. So we'll see what happens. Maybe they can come to uh, some sort of agreement. Uh, so this has been a Cuke Audio Podcast. I'm DC, Booba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear, lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening. <laughs>